It does seem that bullshitting involves a kind of bluff. It's closer to bluffing, surely, than to telling a lie. But what is implied concerning its nature by the fact that it is more like the former than it is like the latter? Just what is the relevant difference here between a bluff and a lie? Lying and bluffing are both modes of misrepresentation or deception. Now the concept more central to the distinctive nature of a lie is that of falsity. The liar is essentially someone who is deliberately promulgates a falsehood. Bluffing too is typically devoted to conveying something false. Unlike plain lying, however, it is more especially a matter not of falsity, but of fakery. That is what accounts for its nearness to bullshit. For the essence of bullshit is not that it is false, but that it is false. <laughs> Oops, okay. Sorry. Let's go. Sorry. 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 Nice shirt. What the hell? Huh. Hey, well, I might need to edit that out. I don't know what just happened. But we're back here, all of us, for the last section of uh, Harry Frankfurt's On Bullshit. Page 46 in the book. The book is 67 of these very, very tiny pages long. And we've gotten kind of to several core elements. One is the notion of bullshit not connected to the truth. And the other one is the relationship between bullshit and bluffing. So I'm going to start where, where I left off yesterday. It may have already been pre-digested. That was my wife. She was reading it. And uh, we'll take it right up to the end. It does seem that bullshitting involves a kind of bluff. It is closer to bluffing, surely, than to telling a lie, but what is implied concerning its nature by the fact that it is more like the former than it is like the latter? Just what is the relevant difference here between a bluff and a lie? Lying and bluffing are both modes of misrepresentation or deception. Now, the concept most central to the distinctive nature of a lie is that of falsity. The liar is essentially someone who deliberately promulgates a falsehood. And bluffing, too, is typically devoted to conveying something false. Unlike plain lying, however, it is more especially a matter not of falsity, but of fakery. This is what accounts for its nearness to bullshit. For the essence of bullshit is not that it is false, but that it is phony. In order to appreciate this distinction, One must recognize that a fake or a phony need not, in any respect, apart from authenticity itself, be inferior to the real thing. What is not genuine need not also be defective in some other way. It may be, after all, an exact copy. What is wrong with a counterfeit is not what it is like, but how it was made. There's an ideal parallel in this concept, if it's difficult for some of you to get, to just think about art forgeries. There are tremendously talented artists who have fooled art experts with representations of Renoir's or Manet's or Monet's. The paintings appeared to be every bit as good as the originals, but they were not made by the originals. The entire source of their value comes from how they were were made, who made them not how well they were made. Back to the book. This points to a similar and fundamental aspect of the essential nature of bullshit. Although it is produced without concern for the truth, it need not be false. The bullshitter is faking things, but this does not mean that he necessarily gets them wrong. In Eric Ambler's novel, Dirty Story, A character named Arthur Abdel Simpson recalls advice he received as a child from his father. Although I was only seven when my father was killed, I still remember him very well and some of the things he used to say. One of the first things he taught me was, never tell a lie when you can bullshit your way through. And that citation is provided in the same OED entry 
as the one that includes the passage from Ezra Pound. The closeness of the relation between bullshitting and bluffing is resonant. It seems to me in the parallelism of the idioms bullshit your way through and bluff your way through. This presumes not only that there is an important difference between lying and bullshitting, but that the latter is preferable to the former. Now, the elder Simpson surely did not consider bullshitting morally superior to lying, nor is it likely that he regarded lies as invariably less effective than bullshit in accomplishing the purposes for which either of them might be employed. After all, an intelligently crafted lie may do its work with unqualified success. It may be that Simpson thought it easier to get away with bullshitting than with lying. Or perhaps he meant that although the risk of being caught is about the same in each case, the consequences of being caught are generally less severe for the bullshitter than for the liar. In fact, people tend to be more tolerant of bullshit than of lies, perhaps because we're less inclined to take the former as a personal affront. We may seek to distance ourselves from bullshit, but we're more likely to turn away from it with an impatient or irritated shrug than with the sense of violation or outrage that lies often inspire. The problem of understanding why our attitude toward bullshit is generally more benign than our attitude toward lying is an important one, which I will leave as an exercise for the reader. Okay, so we got no answers to that from Harry, but... Maybe we can all circle round uh, and figure that out on our own. Back to the book. The pertinent comparison is not, however, between telling a lie and producing some particular instance of bullshit. The elder Simpson identifies the alternative to telling a lie as bullshitting one's way through. This involves not merely producing one instance of bullshit. It involves a program of producing bullshit to whatever extent the circumstances require. This is a key, perhaps, to his preference. Telling a, telling a lie is an act with a sharp focus. It is designed to insert a particular falsehood at a specific point in a set or a system of beliefs in order to avoid the consequences of having that point occupied by the truth. This requires a degree of craftsmanship in which the teller of a lie submits to objective constraints imposed by what he takes to be the truth. The liar is inescapably concerned with truth values in order to invent a lie at all. He must think that he at least knows what's true. And in order to invent an effective lie, he must design his his falsehood under the guidance of that truth. It's ironic, or paradoxical might be a better way to say it, That, and this is not in the book, this is me. It's paradoxical that lies are far, far closer to truth than bullshit is. They are connected, just like zero is connected to one by the quality of absolutely not being one. Back to the book. On the other hand, a person who undertakes to bullshit his way through has much more freedom. His focus is panoramic rather than particular. He does not limit himself to inserting a certain falsehood at a specific point, and thus is not constrained by the truth surrounding that point or intersecting it. He is prepared, so far as required, to fake the context as well. This Freedom from the constraints to which the liar must submit does not necessarily mean, of course, that his task is easier than the task of the liar. But the mode of creativity upon which it relies is less analytical and less deliberative than that which is mobilized in lying. It's more expansive and independent, with more spacious opportunities for improvisation, color, and imaginative play. This is less a matter of craft than of art. Hence the familiar notion of the bullshit artist. My guess is that the recommendation offered by Arthur Simpson's father reflects the fact that he was more strongly drawn to this mode of creativity 
regardless of its relative merit or effectiveness, than he was to the more austere and rigorous demands of lying. What bullshit essentially misrepresents is neither the state of affairs to which it refers, nor the beliefs of the speaker concerning that state of affairs. Those are what lies misrepresent by virtue of being false. Since bullshit need not be false, it differs from lies in its misrepresentational intent. The bullshitter may not deceive us or even intend to do so, either about the facts or about what he takes the facts to be. What he does necessarily attempt to deceive us about is his enterprise. His only indispensably distinctive characteristic is that in a certain way, he misrepresents what he is up to. This is the crux of the distinction between him and the liar. Both he and the liar represent themselves falsely as endeavoring to communicate the truth. The success of each depends upon deceiving us about that. But the fact about himself that the liar hides is that he is attempting to lead us away from a correct apprehension of reality. We're not to know that he wants us to believe something even he supposes to be false. The fact about himself that the bullshitter hides is that the truth values, that is that the truth values of his statements are of no central interest to him. That we're not to understand, what we are not to understand is that his intention is neither to report the truth nor to conceal it. This does not mean that his speech is anarchically impulsive, but that the motive guiding and controlling it is unconcerned with how the things about which he speaks truly are. It is impossible for someone to lie unless he thinks he knows the truth. Producing bullshit requires no such conviction. A person who lies is thereby responding to the truth, and he's to that extent respectful of it. When an honest man speaks, he says only what he believes to be true. And for the liar, it is correspondingly indispensable that he considers his statements to be false. For the bullshitter, however, all bets are off. He is neither on the side of the true nor on the side of the false. His eye is not on the facts at all, as the eyes of the honest man and of the liar are, except insofar as they may be pertinent to his interest in getting away with what he says. He does not care whether the things he says describe reality correctly. He just picks them out or makes them up to suit his purpose. In his essay, Lying, St. Augustine distinguishes lies of eight types, which he classifies according to the characteristic intent or justification with which a lie is told. Lies of seven of these types are told only because they are supposed to be indispensable means to some end that is distinct from the sheer creation of false beliefs. It is not their falsity as such, in other words, that attracts the teller to them. Since they are told only on account of their supposed indispensability to a goal other than deception itself, St. Augustine regards them as being told unwillingly. What the person really wants is not to tell the lie but to attain the goal. They are therefore not real lies in his view, and those who tell them are not, in the strictest sense, liars. A simple example of this might be seeing someone you haven't seen for a while. You may actually be distressed about how they look and say, well, my goodness, you, you look wonderful today. Strictly a lie. You're not intending to lie, but you have, a, you have a motive, which is to make them feel good. So while it might technically be a lie, it's of a lower order. It is only the remaining category that contains what St. Augustine identifies as the lie which is told solely for the pleasure of lying and deceiving, that is, the real lie. Lies in this category are not told as means to any end distinct from the propagation of falsehood. They are told simply for their own sakes, i.e. Out, purely out of a love of deception. And then he quotes Augustine. 
There is a distinction between a person who tells a lie and a liar. The former is one who tells a lie unwillingly, while the liar loves to lie and passes his time in the joy of lying. The latter takes delight in lying, rejoicing in the falsehood itself. What Augustine calls liars and real lies are both rare and extraordinary. Everyone lies from time to time, but there are very few people to whom it would often or even ever occur to lie exclusively from a love of falsity or of deception. For most people, the fact that a statement is false constitutes in itself a reason, however weak and easily overridden, not to make that statement. For St. Augustine's pure liar, it is, on the contrary, a reason in favor of making it. For the bullshitter, it is in itself neither a reason in favor nor a reason against. Both in lying and in telling the truth, people are guided by their beliefs concerning the way things are. These guide them as they endeavor either to describe the world correctly or to describe it deceitfully. For this reason, telling lies does not tend to unfit a person for telling the truth in the same way that bullshitting tends to. Through excessive indulgence in the latter activity, which involves making assertions without paying attention to anything except what it suits one to say, a person's normal habit of attending to the way things are may become attenuated or lost. I'm going to read that again. A person's normal habit of attending to the way things are may become attenuated or lost. So a commitment or a habit of bullshitting actually leaves you somehow unable to perceive the way things really are. Back to the book. Someone who lies and someone who tells the truth are playing on opposite sides, so to speak, in the same game. Each responds to the facts as they understand them, although the response of the one is guided by the authority of the truth, and the response of the other defies that authority and refuses to meet its demands. The bullshitter ignores those demands altogether. He does not reject the authority of the truth as a liar does and depose himself to it. He pays no attention to it at all. By virtue of this, bullshit is a greater enemy of the truth than lies are. One who is concerned to report or to conceal the facts assumes that there are indeed facts that are in some way both determinate and knowable. His interest in telling the truth or in lying presupposes that there is a difference between getting things wrong and getting them right, and that it is at least occasionally possible to tell the difference. Someone who ceases to believe in the possibility of identifying certain statements as true and others as false can have only two alternatives. The first is to desist both from efforts to tell the truth and from efforts to deceive. This would mean refraining from making any assertion whatsoever about facts. And the second alternative is to continue making assertions that purport to describe the way things are but that cannot be anything except bullshit. Why is there so much bullshit? Of course, it's impossible to be sure that there is relatively more of it nowadays than at other times. There's more communication of all kinds in our time than ever before, but the proportion that is bullshit may not have increased. Without assuming that the incidence of bullshit is actually greater now, I will mention a few considerations that help to account for the fact that it currently is so great. Bullshit is unavoidable whenever circumstances require someone to talk without knowing what he is talking about. Thus, the production of bullshit is stimulated whenever a person's obligations or opportunities to speak about some topic exceed his knowledge of the facts that are relevant to that topic. 
This discrepancy is common in public life, where people are frequently impelled, whether by their own propensities or by the demands of others, to speak extensively about matters of which they are, to some degree, ignorant. Closely related instances arise from the widespread conviction that it is the responsibility of a citizen in a democracy to have opinions about everything, or at least everything that pertains to the conduct of his country's affairs. The lack of any significant connection between a person's opinions and his apprehension of reality will be even more severe, needless to say, for someone who believes it is his responsibility as a conscientious moral agent to evaluate events and conditions in all parts of the world. The contemporary proliferation of bullshit also has deeper sources in various forms of skepticism which deny that we can have any reliable access to an objective reality and which therefore reject the possibility of knowing how things truly are. These anti-realist doctrines undermine confidence in the value of disinterested efforts to determine what is true and what is false, and even in the intelligibility of the notion of objective inquiry. One response to this loss of confidence has been a retreat from the discipline required by dedication to the ideal of correctness to a quite different sort of discipline, which is imposed by pursuit of an alternative ideal of sincerity. Rather than seeking primarily to arrive at accurate representations of a common world, the individual turns toward trying to provide honest representations of himself. Convinced that reality has no inherent nature, which he might hope to identify as the truth about things, he devotes himself to being true to his own nature. It is as though he decides that since it makes no sense to try to be true to the facts, he must therefore try instead to be true to himself. But it is preposterous to imagine that we ourselves are determinate and hence susceptible both to correct and to incorrect descriptions while supposing that the ascription of determinacy to anything else has been exposed as a mistake. As conscious beings, we exist only in response to other things, and we cannot know ourselves at all without knowing them. Moreover, there is nothing in theory, and certainly nothing in experience, to support the extraordinary judgment that it is the truth about himself that is the easiest for a person to know. Facts about ourselves are not peculiarly solid and resistant to skeptical dissolution. Our natures are, indeed, elusively insubstantial, notoriously less stable and less inherent than the nature of other things. And insofar as this is the case, sincerity itself is bullshit. The end. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll be back with another book.